Hello, welcome to New Harvest Christian Fellowship, Manchester, England, and thank you for subscribing to our sermon podcast. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. We pray it will be a blessing to your life, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'll give you our contact information at the end of the recording. Thank you once again. Enjoy the preaching. ...into the Word of God, and I'm not going to open with a text, but we'll eventually get to the book of Nehemiah, but not yet. I just want to tell you that it is human nature, at least in my estimation, that uh, for people uh, to desire to achieve and to advance in their life. Are you with me? I believe that most people want to achieve. They want to advance. They, and, and you think about that. At your job, if there's a, a level above you in terms of position or seniority, wouldn't you like to have that position? Most would. At least you'd like the pay of that individual. So I want to ask you today. Actually, I'm going to hold off on that question for just a second. If someone is not interested in advancing, not interested in achievement, then I want to ask you today, is that wrong? Is that wrong? Maybe, maybe not. But we often say if someone doesn't seem to have any desire to achieve or to advance, we often say that person lacks ambition or lacks drive. They have no dedication. And so my point today is to tell you that we should have some desire to achieve and some desire to advance. But the truth is, at least from my estimation, you can disagree if you like, that many people flounder when it comes to growth when it comes to advancing on their job, in their marriage, in athletics, whatever it is they're, they're looking at in their life, they struggle in many areas. And I think sometimes it's because they lack some of the most basic elements of what it takes to actually move forward in their lives. And I'm talking about secular aspects in your job, school, whatever, but also your Christian life. Let me tell you about a man, he's John Wood, and I've spoke about him before. He's a basketball coach, uh, and he uh, is actually probably one of the best basketball coaches of all time. He never coached in the professional National uh, Basketball Association, NBA. He always wanted to work in the NCAA, which is the university system in the United States. And he wanted to do that because he wanted to develop players so them, that they could become their, their best. And he had a lot of understanding of what it took to win. Out of the 12 years that he coached at the highest level, 10 of those years he won the title. His teams won the title. But he had some different types of philosophies for coaching people than most basketball players of his time and generation. For one, he wasn't a harsh man. He wasn't a a, a dictatorial man or an authoritative individual. He, He carried a lot of authority, but he wasn't authoritative against them. And he always required his players to do their best in practice and in the game. It was a requirement. You couldn't play on his team if you weren't willing to give what he called 110%. He believed players could achieve at that level. He also, when he was playing, uh, when games were going on, he never looked at the score. He never cared if they were ahead or behind. He was looking at his players. He was more interested in mechanics and execution of the game. And even more than that, he was more interested in their heart. Did they have heart? And the reason I want to bring this out, and I'm going to talk about this in just a second, is because I believe Christians need heart. Without heart, you're religious. I'm religious. The world is religious. There is something in heart that we all need. He would say, if you can work twice as hard tomorrow, why aren't you doing it now? He also said this, you can never make up for a lost day. And the reason I'm bringing, you out, bringing this out today is because I believe just these simple quotes and these simple information, lines of information, are good advice. The Bible also records a man with similar characteristics. 
not exactly the same, but similar characteristics that I believe we can learn from as Christians. His name was Nehemiah. Nehemiah. As you begin to read about Nehemiah, you you almost instantly realize that he was different from those of his day. There's not a lot written about Nehemiah, but what there is uh, is profound, and it's transformative as you begin to look at it and begin to apply it to your own life. The time that Nehemiah was alive in the nation that he loved was returning from captivity. I hate to say this, but can someone turn the heater off, please? I think I'm going to melt if we don't turn it off. We're having a little trouble with the thermostat. Usually we can't get the church hot enough, and now we can't get it cool enough. Boy, I feel like complaining right now. (laughs) Thank you. If you could turn the uh, off, we have to go outside and do that. Nehemiah loved his nation. He loved the nation that he was from. He loved the people of his nation. But they were, had been brought into captivity for reasons that I can't explain to you today. But they were in captivity. They had been deported from Zion. Zion is synonymous with Jerusalem. Jerusalem mattered to the Jewish people, to the Israelites. And after being freed from Cyrus the Great from captivity, they now had returned to their beloved city of Jerusalem. They had rebuilt the temple, which was very important to them. But the problem was the wall surrounding the city were now laid in ruins. And as he saw this, instead of moaning or complaining, he seeks God in prayer. And I want to bring this out to you today because sometimes the walls of your life are laying in ruins. The things that you love are in despair. The things you want to see happen are not happening. And instead of whining, complaining, or doing something negative, you can do something positive. It's called prayer. And the Bible says in the book of Nehemiah, we're going to put it up on the screen, but if you'd like to turn, you can to Nehemiah chapter 1, starting in verse 1. It says, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, it's around December of the year that they were there. He says, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers came from Judah, and some with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who have survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept, For some days I mourned and fasted, prayed before the God of heaven. Verse 5, then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant is praying before you day and night. For your servants, the people of Israel, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my family, my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But... If you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Pray with me here today. Heavenly Father, I ask, Lord God, for your favor and your grace. I pray for anointing, God, that is not upon me but upon your word. 
that speaks to lives, oh God. Let me issue forth words, cast forth ideas and concepts that come from you and your word. Open your people's hearts to new paradigm for their lives. Help them to experience a freshness that comes from you. I thank you today for your goodness and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to, in the next few weeks, talk with you about many things about Nehemiah, but we must start with who was Nehemiah? Who was this man that we've read about in the Word of God? He served in the government of a king. The king's name was Artaxerxes. That's a hard name to say. He was the king of Persia. At that time, Persia, we, we no longer have Persia anymore, but it was the large area uh, that encompassed part of North Africa as well as part of Arabia and also down into Turkey, Iraq, and Iran. It was a, a large spot at that time on the planet. It shrunk over time and now is no longer even a, a, a province it was said that King Artaxerxes' throne was in Babylonia, which is modern-day Iraq. This was the, known as the seat of anti-Israel, anti-people of God. This was the, the thought, and here this king was sitting on the throne in this area. It's the reason why he took them captive, because he didn't like the Israelites. He didn't like God believers. He didn't like those who followed the one true, the living God, Yahweh, Jehovah, many other names that we could give today. And yet, here was Nehemiah serving in his cabinet, serving in his government. Nehemiah, a God-fearing man, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But here he is in the midst of madness, as we like to say. In the middle of problematic situations where his people had been in bondage, but yet Nehemiah had found some favor. Who was this Nehemiah? First of all, the Bible describes him as a cupbearer. Everybody say cupbearer. This is a prestigious position in that time. He was in charge of the king's security. He would be the one to serve the wine to the king and the king's guests because uh, it was often a form of, or the, the method, the vehicle in which government officials were poisoned it was through the wine. I would venture to say that people are poisoned by wine today. They just don't know that they're being poisoned by wine today. But the point being is that you wanted to have a trustworthy guy serving the drinks. You wanted to have a guy that you put, had confidence in. And this position was only given to a select few. And I want to put in your heart today that God wants to raise up people and put them in positions that most Christians will never ever be part of. We can talk about Kanye West and say, well, why did Kanye West, is, is he really a Christian? Can he be a Christian and be a, a star of his caliber? I don't know, but I know this. We have Nehemiah here. He was in a position that very, very few people were in. He was a cupbearer. I don't think it's a coincidence also, and I want to put this into your heart. I don't think it's a coincidence that God used a person who was, a, in essence, a trusted servant to be able to do such a great work for him. God is looking for trusted servants. If you say, well, what, what, I don't know what my next step in life. I don't know what I should be doing. Well, start off by being trustworthy. And then the next thing is learn how to be a servant and learn that there are depths and degrees of servanthood. Because some people go and they serve for a while and then they pull back. They go and they serve and God honors them and they raise them up and they forget their servanthood. They forget that that's what they're called to do. And the reality is, as God is looking for trusted servants, he says, I was cupbearer to the king. We also see that it was more than that. He was also listed as governor a godly leader in an ungodly situation. God wants to put you as a godly individual in situations and circumstances that are sometimes dark, that are sometimes destitute of godliness. And you may feel all alone. 
There's a reason for that. The Bible says this in the book of Colossians, chapter 3 and verse 22. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it, not only when their eyes are on you to curry favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Even if you're in a diabolical situation such as slavery, do it unto God. Even if you're in a circumstance that makes you feel like you're a slave and I shouldn't have to do this and all of your friends are saying, hey, I wouldn't do that if I was you. I wouldn't be in that. I wouldn't accept none of that. Hey, stand up for your rights. And while there is a time and a place for that, no doubt about that, that's a sermon for another day. There are also times when you have to be like Nehemiah and say, look it, I'm cupbearer to the king. God has me here for a reason. He was governor, governor. It's always nice to work in a Christian environment. It's always nice to be around like-minded believers. But I got to tell you, some of the most biggest arguments I've ever seen happen around me were amongst Christians who work together. (laughs) Someone said, oh, I got uh, hired on at a Christian firm and a Christian boss. I just think, oh, boy, I don't know about that, man. But the truth is, is the Bible says in Colossians 3, 23, the next verse, whatever you do, so whatever you do, whatever your job is, wherever you're at, whether you're a governor, a cupbearer, or something less, or something more, the Bible says, do it, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord and not human masters. Why am I talking about this? Because I want you to never blame your environment for your lack of achievement. I've had pastors who were pioneering and said, well, you know, I was in this city, but this city was too hard, or this city had this, or this problem, I couldn't get a building, I couldn't do that, all legitimate issues, and that's the reason I didn't produce. Not always the case. Sometimes it's in here, and if you didn't produce then, you'll produce somewhere else later on in your life. Maybe the situation you're in, brother or sister, you're not going to see much fruit at the moment. But it's God working something in you for the future to produce something great. Stick with me today. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. On the outside, the part people can see it doesn't look good. But on the inside, God's doing some good things. On the inside, God's ministering, God's blessing, God's helping. This is what was happening here with Nehemiah. He's in this land, Babylonia. He's not in a situation that he enjoys. He feels very sad over the plight of his countrymen, the people that he loved. But he learned to lead in the dark. He learned to lead in the dark. We need people who can lead while it's dark. Anybody can lead when it's blessing and favor and the presence of God. It's like you read about these revivals that happened, you know, and you say, man, anybody could build a church in those days because, man, all you got to do is say, Jesus, boom, people get saved. All you got to do is say, hey, boom, man, they're saved. But it takes a real man or woman of God to raise a family in a dark day. It takes a real man or woman of God to serve at their post day in and day out takes a real man or woman of God to be able to go to a a firm that maybe doesn't have all of the most godly morals and values and still live for Jesus even though the situation is not ideal. And that's what Nehemiah was. There's a last title that he's given. It's a Hebrew word called Tershatha. Tershatha. And the Eastern, Eastern Bible Dictionaries calls it a position of high civil Uh, dignitary. That's what he was, a high civil dignitary. He wasn't a religious person. He wasn't a uh, militia or military force. He he worked in the government that served the people at that time. And the reason I'm bringing out this word is because it's an unusual word that many people disagree about what it means. Some think it's a, a military term as well, that it carries some military aspects to it. The point that I'm bringing with all three of these is that, and as we'll see in a moment, is that Nehemiah's high rank never caused him to think too highly of himself. You know, as God begins to elevate you, can you still stay humble in heart? 
As God begins to elevate you, can you still exalt God? If God was to give you that pay raise, can you still serve God? If God was to give you that position, would you stay involved with the people of God and the things of God and the same kind of friends and family that you were? Or are you going to get too tired of them and move on to a, a new level because you're a new person? See, those are the things that you have to ask as you begin to desire to achieve and advance in your life. And this isn't true all the time, but let me just throw this out because sometimes it is true that people are held back from advancement because if they were to get these positions that they were talked about here, they wouldn't be able to really serve God. And God cares more about his relationship with you than the blessings and favor that he can put upon your life. Are you with me here today? Stay, stay focused here. So the next thing we need to ask, not who was Nehemiah, but what was he like? What was he like? What, what was his character like? What, was, what, what kind of person was he? And the reason why this is important, because it's the heart of a man that really matters. It's the heart of an individual that is most important. Can I give you some advice? Never choose a mate on their looks. Because you might have a cute devil. You might have a handsome, lazy individual. Never choose on their looks. Never choose a mate on the size of their bank account. Money is good for a season, but after a while, that money is just only good for high-value divorces. My point being, character matters. Character matters. Heart matters. Another American sports analogy, the Oakland Raiders, a California team, they had a motto, their football team, American football, and their motto was commitment to excellence. I often wish that their fans had the same commitment to excellence because they were the worst fans in all of the NFL They caused more problems everywhere they went. They were like the American version of hooliganism. So uh, that's what they they did. And uh, they had this term, commitment to excellence. And uh, a great American football player that was uh, on that team, uh, he died recently at the age of 78. I tell you his name, but you wouldn't know his name anyways. And he embodied, uh, his former player said this, that he embodied virtues like Passion, integrity, perseverance, and always led by example. His character on and off the field made all those around him better. So I read that. It was a recent article. I read that. I said, that's Nehemiah as well. That's how he was. And that's how we should be as Christians. Who was he and what was he like? Well, first of all, Nehemiah was what we'll call humble. And I know we throw that word around so much and see it so little. And sometimes when we do see humility, or not not when we see it, but when we label something as humility, we talk about someone who's kind of downtrodden and kind of, you know, meek and mild. And anybody who has any kind of bold personality couldn't possibly be humble. And yet, that's not what we see. Here in Nehemiah's life, he was in his high position. Remember, we already have labeled that. In his high position. And he yet he understood the need for forgiveness and repentance. Forgiveness and repentance. I know these are basic terms to Christians, but practice so little in our generation. During the last U.S. presidential campaign, there was a debate among some of the presidential candidates, and the moderator, his name was Frank Luntz, he said, asked Donald Trump this, he said, have you ever asked God for forgiveness for your actions? Mr. Trump replied, I'm not sure I have. I just go on and try to do a better job from there. I don't think so. I think if I do wrong, I think I just try and make it right. I don't bring God into that picture. I don't. He was being perfectly frank and honest, but he's a far cry from what Nehemiah was. And this is not an indictment against Mr. Trump. He's not trying to be a pastor. He's trying to be a president. 
But I'm telling you here as Christians, if you're going to have real high moral character, you're going to have to understand the need for forgiveness and asking for forgiveness. Would you please forgive me? When was the last time you said those words or something very close to it to an individual? When was the last time you said that before God? I'm not talking about some trite thing that people say often, you know. Oh, Lord, forgive me, I've sinned, you know. Or you come before God, forgive me for this, 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 and that. You lay out your laundry list. I'm talking about an act of humility. Humility that lets your life and work speak for themselves. You don't have to be a braggart or a person who boasts. You can let that speak for themselves because Nehemiah was a high-caliber leader. He was an individual who exercised his authority when it was necessary, but he never ever had to tell people he was in charge. He never ever had to go by his title. As a matter of fact, of all the titles he gave in the word of God, he says, I was cupbearer to the king. I was the one that might drink the poison in honor of the king, an ungodly king. Man, talk about integrity and character. Nehemiah was also confident confident. When the unbelieving king asked Nehemiah, hey, what's wrong with you? Because he was down. He says, you're not sick, so something must be wrong with you. And Nehemiah's response was, well, of course something's wrong with me. My countrymen are in exile, and they're having problems, and the walls of the city are burned down. Uh, It's not going well. And, And he's telling this to an unbelieving king. It's like telling someone that's not a Christian, uh, I'm believing God. Most of the time, they couldn't care less if you're believing God. But when you're bold and you're confident in the things of God, you say stuff like that. Not just the words, but from the heart. Because he truly was in anguish over what was going on. He truly wanted help and assistance. He wanted to change the circumstance and the situation. He believed in God, uh, and he had no problem telling King Artaxerxes, hey, here's what's going on. Can you help me? Sometimes, just a little side note about confidence, is that some uh, people call themselves confident, and really they're just proud and arrogant, right? I'm just being confident. And then other times, you're just being confident. People will say you're proud and arrogant. People give you ideas. You say, no, we're not doing that. We're doing this. Well, why are we doing this? Because this is what I'm doing. And they look at you and say, well, who are you? Well, I'm the leader. Well, so what? Don't you listen to anybody else? Of course I do, but not right now. And see, that's the problem that happens so many times. And so what you have to look at here is when you have in your own heart, you're humble before God you have the ability to also be confident in the things of God. And if people misunderstand or misjudge you, that's their responsibility, and it's on them. Can you say amen? Amen. Nehemiah was confident in a way that a leader should be, and one of the things that is so necessary in our world, in our church, in the Christian world, in the UK in general, and in the secular world, around the world, there is a need for real, true leaders, people who can lead as God wants them to lead. Nehemiah knew what God expected from him. Do you know what God expects from you? Because, see, we pray, God, give me this, And God can and will oftentimes give us things, but he doesn't give it to us without expectation. He has expectations upon our lives. Do you know what that is? And if you don't, you should pray that. Specifically, I'll give you the words. Lord, what is it that you expect from me in this situation? Sometimes he'll lead you right to a passage. That's why you got to read your Bible all the time because sometimes when you're praying... He's going, he wants to lead you to a spot, but if you don't read it all the time, you can't get to that spot. But if you read it all the time, and even if it's not really impacting you, when that time comes and you pray something like I just told you to pray, you know right where to go. Sometimes he leads you to a verse. Sometimes he leads you to a, a concept, and he gives you an idea, boldness, work, humility, and he'll tell you what to do. This is what he expects. 
he also knew what God had placed in his heart. And he said that. God had put this in my heart. See, God does put things in your heart. But I want you to know that you better know if God put it there or not. Because sometimes it's pretty amazing to me, and I say that tongue-in-cheek. In other words, I don't really believe it when people say this. But they say, God put it in my heart, the very same thing they wanted to do. <laughs> God put it in my heart to start this and do that. And it's amazing how God put that in your heart because you were just saying a week ago, that's exactly what you wanted to do. <laughs> Now, oftentimes they are together. Don't get me wrong. God's not going to tell you if you hate cooking. He's not going to tell you, hey, go open a restaurant. <laughs> not going to do that. That's probably almost for sure. But my point being is that some, there's a lot of things that come in our minds, a lot of things that come in our hearts. And we have to know when God has placed something. And if he's placed something in your heart, man, don't deviate. Stick with it until he might change that. And if he does change that, that's Okay. Because you followed it for a season. I, I want to share some things from my own life, but if I do that, I'm going to violate somebody else, and I'm not going to do that. It's another lesson that you should learn. It's never ever share things that's going to hurt somebody else or cast a different light on somebody else because that's not your uh, uh, prerogative. He knew what God had placed in his heart. And number three, we see about him as a leader, being the leader he should be. He worked tirelessly, tirelessly toward the goal, toward the goal. We're watching an interview, uh, Gracie and I, recently about a particular uh, actor that you all would know, and he was talking about the film that he was in. You would all know the film. I'm not telling you the actor of the film because then you'll think I either endorse it or I don't endorse it. I'm not going to give you that. <laughs> I don't endorse it or not endorse it. I don't think anything of it. I watched an interview. That's all I did. <laughs> And as I watched the interview, we watched the interview together, I was amazed when he talked about how months on end he worked every single day on this particular uh, role that he was in. And then when he would get off of work, at the end of their 12 to 14 hour days, he would get on the phone uh, to the director, the producer, the guy who was heading up the film, and talk for two more hours, he said, every single day concerning his role. I remember thinking, man, what dedication, what commitment to putting on a movie. And I'm not against movies. I like the cinema as much as the next guy. But I want to tell you something, that doesn't matter as much as many other things in life. And people work far less at those than these guys do at that. And my point being today is that Nehemiah did exactly what you would expect from a leader. He worked tirelessly toward the goal. And as this series progresses, we'll see that he was able to maintain his focus, which is another thing that, another thing that we all need to do. Nehemiah was confident. Nehemiah was also a God follower. God follower. See, and I don't want to take too much time, and we've talked about this before, but I do want to point this out, is that there's a difference between a person who says that they're a churchgoer and a God follower. There's a big difference between someone who calls himself a Christian and someone who follows after Christ. There, there, there's a difference, and, and one is better than the other. The follower is better than the non-follower. And so he was not only a person who was involved in religion or religious affairs, but he was a God follower. And you can tell by his prayer. The Bible says the words of his prayer. He understood that God was a supreme ruler over all of the universe. He recognized that God made covenants and contracts with his people. He understood this about God. And this is so important because many people, even Christians, sometimes don't recognize that God lays down contracts covenants that he's going to stick with and no matter how much we pray or whine or wish or sound good or quote this guy or that guy he's not changing that his word is his bond and what his covenant is that's what we stick with <laughs> he understood all of that he understood the love of God but he understood more than the love of God he understood the love for God that's a big difference as well that many people don't talk about 
I was reading the words of an atheist yesterday, and the atheist was saying, you know, God, if he exists, is the most disappointing God ever. You ask him things, and things don't come to pass. And I thought, man, you've totally missed the point, dude. It's not just about getting things from God. And if you're disappointed, it's because you had the wrong expectations of God. If you're disappointed, all you wanted was stuff from God. Now, I'm angry when I think about that. It's wrong. <laughs> wrong philosophy. And you know what angers me is that many Christians can't stand up to that. We should be able to a- a- advocate against that sort of thing. But my point being is that many Christians talk about the love of God, but they don't understand the love for God. The love for God. All of these ingredients equated Nehemiah into a true God follower. And I think all the things you see on the screen, while they're basic and often talked about in Christian church, when these are put inside of a man, put inside of an individual, this is the type of individual that God can actually put something in their heart. Because most of what I hear, and I don't say this to be rude, but I do want to just be candid with you. So most of what I hear, people say, God put in my heart, I have my doubts. I have my doubts, I don't say anything, and if you tell me that, I'll pray with you, yes, praise God. But I've noticed that when people are like this, and God puts something in their heart, it's real. And that's what we want, folks. I'm not just trying to fill the church with bodies, I'm trying to church, fill the church with worshipers, saved people, individuals uh, who really come to Christ. I want the real deal, <laughs> I've never wanted fake. (laughs) When something needs to be done in the world, and we're changing gears here, and we're almost done. When God needs something done in the world, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, he puts it in the heart of a leader. They may not be fully realized as a leader, but God sees that leadership in them. And he puts it in them. That's why I think it's important for us to develop as leaders, men especially, but not exclusively. Develop as leaders so God can put the things that he needs done in our hearts. I'm not talking about people who have a title of a leader and are put over something. Uh, That's pretty easy to do. I'm talking about somebody that would lead uh, if they were in the desert with uh, uh, four camels around them. They would still lead. That's the kind of individual what we're looking for. That's the kind of individual that Nehemiah was. He had a godly heart. And yeah, that is why God put it in the heart of Nehemiah. If you think about it, and we're going to study this as well, Nehemiah didn't get the job done on his own. Very little was actually done by him, but much was accomplished through him. And that's what God is looking for, people that not only can do things for him, but can be accomplished through them. And if I could just take five seconds and say, please, that's what I'm trying to do. I can do all the work myself, most of it, I'm getting older now, but that's not the key. I need God to move through me in order to see things accomplished. That's what Nehemiah had as a desire. It's hard to imagine anybody receiving a godly vision without a godly heart. And I think if you want to advance, whether it be on your job or school or in your church, I think you're going to have to have a godly heart. I mean, if you're just talking about money or position, well, anybody can do that, I think. You know, I think that's evident by our government officials in any country in the world. (laughs) They're often produced by people who are less than godly. I'm talking, though, about really doing something that's eternal, something that really matters. And it does matter. Even secular jobs, don't get me wrong. We need top-notch lawyers for God, top-notch doctors and IT individuals and laborers and accountants and bank workers, and the list goes on and on. We need godly people in all of those areas. But if you want God to advance you, or you want to advance, you're going to have to have the same or similar qualities of Nehemiah. I don't really have a good ending point here today. 
And the reason is because you need to stay tuned. You need next week, and you need the week after. And if you can get that and put it all together, it's going to help you. My desire today as we close is that you would say, you know, I like Nehemiah, because you should. I want to emulate Nehemiah, imitate him to a degree. Not clone yourself of a Nehemiah. Not name your firstborn kid Nehemiah. If you want to, you can. But not that. What I'm talking about is becoming like Nehemiah. This person of character like him. If you can make that decision today, that step, then this altar calls for you. And we're going to pray for you. Why don't we all stand to our feet today? If you've been blessed or challenged by today's preaching and you'd like to get in touch with us, the easiest way is via our website at www.newharvestuk.com. You can email us at info at newharvestuk.com or look us up on Facebook or Twitter. You can call us on 0161 278 6305 or you can even write to us at 194 Chapel Street, Salford, Manchester, M3 6BY. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome for you to join us at any of our services. However you might be feeling and whatever you might have been told, know this. God loves you and there's a place for you in his kingdom. God bless you. We're praying for you. And once again, thank you for listening.